Hello, I'm horror cartoonist Dennis St. John. I draw monsters and write twisted tales. As you can imagine, I was a little obsessed with Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Lucky for me, so were most of my high school friends. All except one. One friend who stubbornly refused to join the Scoobies. So here we are, 20 some odd years later. I'm teaming up with Doc Travis, John Teach Landis, and maybe a special guest or two. And we're going to make our friend, Michael Poli, watch one episode of Buffy a week until he's no longer the Buffy Virgin. Uh, welcome to Buffy Virgin, a spoiler-free Buffy the Vampire Slayer podcast. We're going to be talking Teenage Rage with Season 5, Episode 13, Blood Ties. I'm your host, monster expert Dennis St. John. Uh, why don't you guys introduce yourself from furthest to your birthday to closest? Well, today is my birthday, so well done. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm the Virgin. I've only seen Buffy the Vampire Slayer up to Season 5, Episode 13. Uh, very excited to be here today on my birthday. Happy birthday! Happy birthday, Michael! Happy birthday! <laughs> and it's it's Buffy's birthday as well. I didn't even make that connection. Yeah, you sh- you're sharing your birthday with uh, Buffy today. <laughs> That's so random. That has to do with the order we watched it. It has nothing to do with actual birth dates. But I felt special seeing all her gifts. <laughs> <laughs> I wish well, they were mine. <laughs> I wish they were mine. <laughs> my name's John. My birthday is in January. I don't know really that if that where that puts me exactly. But hello. My name's Travis, and my birthday is in July, but already already passed, so I guess I should have gone before John, but... All right, uh, so this episode, yeah, we're going to be watching season season five, episode 13, Blood Ties, uh, but before that, we're going to review uh, season five, episode whatever, uh, Shadow. Uh, we're going to do the reactions to that. Audience Reactions. All right, so we're going to start with um, at Dingo Action, who says, uh, Buffy Virgin Pod, uh, so does Michael think Glory is late to a gathering, a shindig, or a hootenanny? Uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, clearly a shindig. <laughs> 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 but that's wonderful. That's a great callback to uh, Nas' comment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, at Ren and Nas says, okay. I have to call out a false equivalency of Buffy and Riley's reactions re cheating. What Buffy did in Fool for Love was research for the purpose of understanding her own mortality that is in li- that uh, is in literally no way equivalent with self sabotage and vamp play. No, no, no. Uh so thanks for that. I think I'm the one who made that equivalency. Um so thanks for calling me out. I think I just sometimes I just do things to create arguments <laughs> and cuz I see like A point to like, yeah, they're not things I really believe in. I just like, like to create frustrating arguments. Uh, So thank you for calling me out. I deserve it. (laughs) This is like the worst kind of nerd. Just like creating drama. I'm an asshole. I don't know. I thought it was good for the podcast to be like. Uh, So speaking of me getting called out on things. uh, sorry if I'm going to pronounce your name wrong because I'm going to stutter, so there's no way it's going to be right. Uh, Kapa Nagoi says uh, Kevin Weisman was never on Angel, uh, which I claimed in that episode, and you were totally right. I was thinking of Maury Sterling. Um, I totally got that wrong. Uh, so cool. I'm uh, zero for two so far. All right. Uh, Anana Mouse says... Um, I don't think Spike is the new Xander. Uh, there's an acknowledgement that he's a stalker and is, that his behavior is wrong, where Xander's behavior was often portrayed as harmless. That said, James Marster's Spike, uh, James Marster's Spike is so charismatic that anything he does is going to uh, be emulated and excused regardless of the writer's intentions, um, which I think is interesting. And uh, uh, Geraint Thatcher, kind of to add on to that, says, um, at the time, they didn't know how far to take the Spike to uh, take Spike and Buffy, so it changed from episode to episode depending on the writer. David Fury, the writer of Shadow, was openly anti-Buffy Spike, uh, which got him some heat from fans at the time. So I think those are interesting. Yeah, and I, I hear that this isn't too much of a spoiler, that this conversation about Spike is obviously going to be ongoing. Uh, Spike's behavior is going to be, a, I think, a source of controversy as we go forward. Yeah, totally. Uh, and, uh, Sagov nine says, uh, I want to make a joke about these predictions, but I also don't want to give anything away. Anyway, keep up the good work. 
So thank you. All right, uh, that is reactions. So uh, why don't we do the summary? The Summary. Buffy, Season 5, Episode 13, Blood Ties. Written by Stephen S. DeKnight and directed by Michael Gershom. The original air date was February 6, 2001. The Scooby gang is gathered at the magic shop discussing strategy when the subject of the mysterious key comes up again. Glory is a crazy hell god looking for the key and draining the mental energy of the humans in Sunnydale in the process. As Tara notes, she's a brain sucker, folks. Since the game becomes more and more focused on the key, Buffy and Giles finally explain that Dawn is the key. While the gang is upset to find out Buffy had not been telling the truth about Dawn, Buffy is totally justified because after learning the truth, everyone acts completely differently around Dawn, and eventually this spooks her to run away in the middle of the night. She unfortunately runs into Spike, who helps her break into the magic shop in order to read Giles' notebook and finds out the truth about herself. She returns to the party and tragically cuts herself to see if she really bleeds. Dawn gets suspended from school and then overhears Buffy and her mom arguing and decides to run away and starts a fire to burn her diaries. She wanders through town and eventually ends up at Sunnydale General Hospital in the psych ward. She runs into the friendly intern Ben and reveals she is the key, only to be horrified when Ben transforms to reveal glory. Buffy and the Scooby Gang arrive to save Dawn and are only able when Willow tra teleports Glory outside of the hospital, but at great physical cost to herself. The Summer Sisters make up and go home to fight another All day. All right, thanks. Uh, <laughs> so guys, uh, what were your great lines from this episode? Great lines. Uh, my favorite line was, I think it, it's uh, Buffy says, how was school today? And uh, Don says the usual big square building filled with boredom and despair. As a teacher, I uh, really appreciated that. But it also made me wonder, where is Don going to school since uh, Sunnydale High School has been exploded? Well, she's yeah, uh, she's in middle school at the last year. Of middle That's school. true. She may still be in at, at Sunnydale Middle School instead of Sunnydale High. That's a good point. Yeah, where? Well, yeah, but. For like three years or two years now, where are where kids going to school? I mean, in real life, they probably put them in trailers while they worked in a new school. That's the, that's the common practice, but I don't know. Like when they visit that blown up building, but we never see trailers attached to it. Yeah. Um, I liked when Glory said, never send a minion to do a God's work, which is just so like over the top and lovely. <laughs> And then I, I loved Anya's line at the magic shop, which is like, oh, when she sees Don, you make a very pretty little girl. <laughs> uh, which Travis said the same line was so good. Nice. Um, I like uh, it's a similar uh, people trying to like not act weird around Don. Um, so Xander's me, Test. me, not weird. <laughs> all right. And before we get into weird notices and trivia, I'll give you guys all the kill count. The kill count. It's pretty high this week. We have three humans, four lumpy minions, which I didn't know to class if I was going to classify them as demons or not. I don't because I don't exactly know what they are. Uh, one brain drain, one brain drain, and uh, round three of Glory Buffy Smackdown in a surprise twist goes to Willow and Tara. Uh, so let's move on to weird noticings and trivia. Weird Noticings. So this episode has Buffy hiding things from her friends because the, she and Giles know that Dawn is the key. And everyone's a little bit upset, like the Scooby Gang is upset that they're not in on it. Um, except you can't tell them anything. So I, I kind of... I like flipped on this in the episode because I'm like, oh, at one point, you know, you totally do on the episode because in the beginning part where Xander's like, uh, hey, we you know put our lives online all the time. We should definitely have access to information. Uh, and then they totally blow it. They can't hold a secret at all. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> no, you should never share, share anything with the Scooby Gang if it's important. They are such a mess. Yeah, I I had this. I had a same thing of like the Scooby Gang still has not learned healthy boundaries. Like the way like Xander's argument about like you know if we're putting our lives on the line, we need to know all the information makes sense. But like. Willow's reaction is just like, you have information that I don't, and it makes me upset. Like, <laughs> right. <laughs> totally. Like, I mean, I know they're 20, and 20-year-olds 20 don't have, like, a great idea of, like, healthy relationships at all, but, like, 
They they gotta learn boundaries, man. <laughs> but they just have they have no ability to assess their own weaknesses either. Like yeah. they're just it's raw emotion, like their response. But like they're all weak on holding information and keeping it secret, especially Anya and Xander. <clears throat> but also, I mean, gosh, Tara and Willow are bad. Like they're all weak on that, and they don't recognize it at all. I mean, I, yeah. I get that's part of the show is like these kinds of things, but still, like I would. I think this is a something they need to become aware of, but they're not going to. So I have no prediction about them becoming aware of this weakness. <laughs> oh, um, did you notice that during the fight between the, I think they're demons, by the way, I'll go out on a limit. The demons fighting the Knights of the Byzantium, <laughs> they use a rope and they swing yeah. in. <laughs> like one of them is using a rope to the tree that must have already been tied to the tree because they show up in the middle of the night secretively. So that was like a rope swing or like yeah. a climbing rope the knights had already <laughs> attached to the tree, but was somehow tied. I mean, it makes no sense. You can watch that fight scene and it's like, it's like someone w- w- watched like murder and watch some like swashbuckler movie. Like the set director, the, the fight director's like, man, I just, I just watched like, um, I don't know what the famous swashbuckler movie was, but you know, it's like, Rabbit all right, let's get a rope in this. Yeah. No, I, I like that fight scene a lot. Cause it answers that age old medieval question. Who would win well-armored knights or monks with no <laughs> armor? <laughs> like, we totally find out why Glory doesn't have a large legion of followers. She just sends them in their robes to get stabbed. Like, <laughs> it's like a it's like a totally unequal. It's almost like a video game fight. Like it's so unequal. <laughs> it really is. I mean, uh, they can only win by surprise, but they ruin it by like they had like has a little speech or something like, ha, we got you, right? Something dumb. And then they completely ruin it and then they have the one rope. You know, only one guy swings in. <laughs> If they had four <laughs> rooms. It's I mean, also just, like, I mean, the get the thing they, they do is like they're praying to like our the the priests or just sorry, the the knights are praying to like what I assume is like just our regular Anglo like Christian god, and they have a god who takes action. So like that's the, their big weapon is like a literal a god who's actually there on our plane. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I'm sure that's but, what gives them their absurd confidence is that Glory yeah. is there backing them up. But she's like, but Glory does time. not, yeah, does not act until they're almost all dead. She's late to this shindig. <laughs> it's mostly almost a slaughter nanny. <laughs> and also, how smart do you think your minions are if they if they like go into this battle? Like, no offense, these minions are not very bright. If they think like, oh, we've got great odds. Right. You should, <laughs> yeah, really. But Glory doesn't give off a huge amount of intelligence right now. Glory's kind of really mission focused and yeah, she's not really super, super intelligent. Well, the thing is, they're almost like it's almost an ambush, but they just they blow it so bad. Like they would be fine if they didn't announce their arrival <laughs> and like tried to be sneaky. Like it's like the battle tactics are all in place, except they're they have the I guess the monks have no training. So they're like, cool. Glory told us to do these tactical things. Yeah. And then like, ha ha. <laughs> Whatever their dumb line. Yeah. Is. Yeah. They're, they're, they're playing just Leroy. They need to be playing Metal Gear. Yeah. They're just Leroy Jenkins. They're way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Oh, Buffy and Don both hate school. Who says they're not <laughs> sisters? <laughs> Who indeed. Now I'm the now I'm the troll demon, right? Or what was it? What was the troll from a couple weeks ago? The troll Olaf. Or, Olaf. Now I'm Olaf the troll, huh? <laughs> um, I have uh, just just fair warning ahead of time. Like, uh, there's a lot of zoom in and enhance to be done in this episode, so I'm going to kind of dive into a little bit of that here. Um, so if you freeze frame it at just the right moment, you can see that. Uh, in the uh, series of posters on the back of your door that tell you who you are, like, you know, if you're Riley, your 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 balls poster tells you like, who you are as a human. And if you're if you're Buffy and Willow, your chocolate poster tells you who you are. So Dawn has a poster uh, and I found a copy of it on the Internet so you can actually read it. It says, all I need to know about life, I learned from my dog. And it has a Aww, set of a uh, cute little things that uh, life lessons that you learn from your dog, such as if you stare at someone long enough, eventually you'll get what you want. When it comes to having sex, if at first you don't succeed, bag. We're done. 
that doesn't seem like we- that doesn't fit in the dog persona. I mean, the begging <laughs> does, but like dogs begging for sex. That's crazy. If it's not wet and sloppy, it's not a real kiss. Yeah, it's a bit creepy. Actually, this poster. <laughs> I'll always give people a friendly greeting. A cold nose in the crotch is effective. <laughs> yep. That is not great. That's not great. I did notice the parental advisory poster in her room, in Dawn's Classic. room, which is, which is very era appropriate. Yeah, totally. I had one. I think Mike had did one. Did you really? <laughs> I mean, if not, they were just around. That feels yeah. like the ephemera of the 90s. It like does. had to have had that. <laughs> because it was created in the 90s. And yeah. It was oh, one actually of the sing- created in the nineties. <laughs> well, I, but the late I think it was late, like nineteen eighty nine. It was, um, was it? It was uh, Tipper G- Gore. Tipper right? Gore. Yep, she yeah. created it. Right, and you only bought music that had parental advisory because that's how you knew it was good music. Yeah, that's how you knew it was pushing the boundaries. <laughs> John, um, why don't you you do another zoom and enhance right here's now? Here's another one. Uh, so as Spike is picking the lock, which by the way, as someone who's done a little recreational lock picking, the way he's picking that lock is totally unrealistic, but whatever. Uh, more he usually just bursts down doors. <laughs> <laughs> but more interestingly, you can see the business hours of the magic box, which I actually think are pretty cool because, uh, first of all, it has all the hours and at the bottom. It says, except on full moon. So the <laughs> business hours are different when there's a full moon, but also I think it's interesting. First of all. Uh, on most weekdays, they are open from 10 to 9. So that's 11 hours. So Giles can't be working that all by himself. He's, there's got to be times when it's just Anya minding the shop. So that's important to me. Um, but also on Friday and Saturday, it's open 10 to 12. So do you think it's open for only two hours? Or do you think that they're open until midnights on the weekend? Which one do you think is more likely? John, this is America. They used the 12 hour clock, not, not fancy <laughs> England where it would say 24, 10 to 24, huh? So you get, think it's open till midnight? Of- is, that, is that what you think? Yeah. It's more likely sure. to be open for mid- till midnight than two hours. So if you Although- could go to the magic box at midnight on Fridays, that's like, that's some party magic. Well, imagine Although showing I up think, at 11 I think the real hours are more like uh, Patty's Irish pub for It's Always Sunny, where they're like, they're open when the cast is there. <laughs> if they're out having adventures, it's not open. Uh, so I, I love the Dawn Spike hang zone. It is super fun. And I don't know why she's telling Spike everything she's up to, inviting him to go steal stuff with her. Like, this is just, it is a weird, unlikely hang zone, but it is lovely to watch. So I like it, but it is weird. <laughs> I also I think we've talked about this but I guess acknowledging that Spike is doing creepy stuff is great mm-hmm. um, and it does a good job as pointed out it does differentiate him from Xander since Xander did creepy things that were not acknowledged uh, and that's part of the humor of the whole situation Right. but uh, it's kind of a adorable I don't know what this relationship is like I've never seen this relationship of young girl older guy that's just like wants to do evil <laughs> wants to like commit crimes but also like they're so casual like there's no sense that they're going to get in trouble. Attacked. Yeah. <laughs> like there's just the vibe on this is very playful. And like, I like this vibe so much. I want a TV show. That's just this, these two characters, a <laughs> cool British guy. Who's like kind of punk, like a punk British dude. And then a suburban white teen that hang out and commit crimes casually, but are mostly looking for information about her life or family or something like this is great. This should be a movie. I like him very cautiously stealing that crystal. Uh, it's not in the dialogue. It's just like hand movement. Because it is like, uh, is this a crystal that contains a troll? <laughs> oh, and I did like the knowledge of the troll where Spike tries to pick up the troll hammer and just yeah. like total fail. And then just like acts like it's no big deal. <laughs> First of many Joss Whedon hammer picking up jokes. Ooh. Oh, <laughs> this is where it all started. <laughs> Um, I can't believe Spike. Spike is not smart. He was smoking in the magic shop. It's so obvious when someone smokes in an establishment where you're not supposed to smoke and then ashes everywhere. I mean, it just it was so it was so stupid. Sorry. Spike is dumb. Spike is dumb. He is not smart. (laughs) (laughs) He's not intuitive, nor is he smart, nor is he a good person. No, he's in fact, he's not even a person at all. (laughs) I, I find he's very intuitive, but he's just kind of he's kind of dumb in weird places. 
He's uh, dumb when the story calls for him to be dumb. Well, he's like not strategic, except so, yeah. I guess sometimes he's strategic. He's like magically dumb. I don't know. <laughs> when you're magically dumb? Yeah. <laughs> I obviously doesn't care about getting caught. Like that's a place he's allowed to go in. Like there was no vampire specialness about it, right? Because like he's been in the magic shop. He's allowed to go there. So only Giles slept there. They should have just taken the keys from Giles. Like yeah. the fact that they even have to break in is silly. Oh my god. Uh John, why don't you do another zoom and enhance? Okay, I was really excited about this because uh as since Dawn has been introduced as a character, she always has these diaries, and I'm constantly pausing and trying to figure out if I can read any of them because it's very clear that there's like there's multiple Dawn diaries and that there's something very much written in all of them, but I haven't been able to read any of them until this episode. So I'm really psyched. So as she's tearing her diary up, you get a shot. Good, good, good view of it. Left three pages here. Um, can anyone else? Can somebody call out John being creepy for reading this teenage girl's diary? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's spike level creepiness, John. Impressive. <laughs> all right. Well, now now I don't want to read it to you. <laughs> John, you well, I'm so spike. happy he did this. <laughs> this is John, so goofy. John, you're the spike of this podcast. <laughs> Great. You're and you're British. It's perfect. We've been yelling at you to get a get a nice fake British accent and and all you need to do. Now he's never going to get it, guys. <laughs> you call him Spike. <laughs> so the first page that we can read, uh it says brats in giant colored in letters at the top. And then it says, "I want to strangle these little and there's one word I can't quite make out, but I want to strangle these little something brats." They spilled grape juice on my best gray blouse. And on the next page, we find out who she's talking about. And she says, well, never say never. I agreed to sit for those Norton kids. Mrs. Norton practically begged me and offered me my hourly rate plus $20 extra. Couldn't refuse that. Our class is trying to plan a trip down to Ensenada. And mom said I could go if I pay for half. I think she just likes to torture me by having me babysit for the Nortons. Maybe Buffy will loan me some armor or daggers to protect myself. <laughs> oh, well. And Sonata, here we come. Sunnydale Spanish class road trip. And then uh, two pages later, she tears out some pages. Two pages later, uh, you get a shot. And um, I think this is amazing. So January, it's dated January something. Can't quite make out the exact date. It says, well, I did it. I gave my oral report in speech class. I taped my voice of a poem and then spoke with that and retaped it over again and again. It was like a choral singing. Erin thought I was cheating in not being in a group, but I got an A. I was so scared. Ding dong, the oral report is dead. <laughs> so I just want to, a couple things. I'm just really pleased because, first of all, these this is canon. It's in the show. It's on screen. It's a story about Dawn. It's canon. Okay. <laughs> and no one knew about it until now. I'm just ah, pleased yeah. about that. Yeah, put that on the Buffy Virgin uh, blog somewhere. Like, John's a, a John's on. a freaking archaeologist. He's like, what are they, dig a digital archaeologist? What are they? And, and he's, a, really, he's, a, he's a forensic. He's a forensic one. Right. And I really, really like the um, this story about her oral report. This like weird sort of like uh, hack together analog technology effect of like recording your voice over and over again. That's super cool. Oh, it sounds like a uh, sounds like a way to do a plot summary. <laughs> no, those are yeah, that, those are really surprisingly well done and in character. These are great. Yeah, I don't know who wrote these. Like, I I in my imagination that it's Michelle Trachtenberg. Like, because you know some actors do keep a diary in character as like a method acting thing. And so like I'm my hope, my secret hope is that this is all her writing and that she like really fleshed out this entire insane backstory to the Dawn character and all the mundane details of her life, which is also not real. Some of it. I don't know. You know, she has a, I think she has an Instagram. If you want to like post this to the Instagram and then tag her and ask her, if she wrote it. I would have to get an Instagram account to do that. Buffy Virgin has one. We okay. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> it might freak. Michelle Trachtenberg out a little. I don't know. <laughs> it's a fictional diary. It's not a real diary. Yeah, yeah we're, not, we're not asking her for her real diary. Just curious who on set did it. Gosh, being on a TV show must be so creepy because it might follow you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Well, um, so Buffy sure knows how to ruin her own birthday party. Like even before Dawn comes in with her arms cut up, like Buffy is clearly about to ruin her party by talking about how she's single 
uh, to like Tara and Willow, right? And it's like I'm watching that. I'm like, oh, Buffy, what are you doing? This is there's a pity party now, <laughs> like just because so no, and like basically we all know Buffy's birthday has to be ruined somehow. And I'm expecting yeah. a monster, but I'm not expecting Dawn to walk in having tried to kill herself or like to see if she has real blood. Like this is fucked up. That is such a fucked up scene. I can't believe they included that. That's a, cr- that like was shocking to have Dawn come out like that. And like, I guess I'm like, am I real? <laughs> like freaking cut herself. Like that level of detachment is insane. Uh, I, that was a shocking scene. That's it. And uh, yeah. Don sure knows how to ruin a birthday that Buffy was already planning on ruining. <laughs> Did you have thoughts about that? Did you react to that even later? Or? No, it's intense. Um, I wrote a note of like, oh, Don's a cutter. But then I was like, I'm not going to. Never mind. I'm going to erase that note. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, it's it's a it, shocking moment of like yeah. violence and gore. <laughs> On a, like a so-called horror show. I mean, I guess it's like more of a supernatural type show, but like it's like mundane violence can be extraordinarily scary. I guess yeah, just great Trachtenberg acting. It was fantastic. I totally, oh, totally believe she, it. She was screaming this episode that like was putting Willow's screams. Like she's, I think she's the only one in the show that can like match Willow's like intense screams. Like remember when Willow was in the high school yeah. and she would scream yeah. like. Joss Whedon, it seemed, had a thing for Willow screaming, and it's like Michelle Trachtenberg in this episode's like, I can go an octave higher. <laughs> but her no, she, acting in general in this episode is, is really, really I'll striking. Correct. It just, yeah, it, it's a very affecting performance. Totally. Uh, Xander, never proudly brag about a 14-year-old <laughs> having a crush on you. It does not matter the context. <laughs> What was his phrase? He's like, some guys have it or like, yeah. Yeah. some guys are just cooler. Some guys are just cooler. <laughs> the, the Giles reaction of just like walking away. was really good. That was some excellent <laughs> silent acting. Oh man. Also that Sunnydale alley they were walking in was destroyed. <laughs> there was trash everywhere. And only, only uh, Giles was looking in the trash cans. Yeah. Like, Xander was just It's a little around. alarming that he thinks she might be in the trash cans. Oh, like, I didn't even yeah. think about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Xander isn't looking at anything. He's just having his own little like personal monologue. Yeah. Because he's a great guy. <laughs> uh in that scene where they're searching for Don, Spike getting walked in while painting his nails is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it makes you like Spike. And I mean, the first the other scene that he's in with Don is amazing, too. But like Spike in this episode is amazing and also unnecessary, but amazing. Uh, he's too charismatic for this show. He, ne- he needs his own show and like forget this show. Uh, but also just like that whole move of Buffy, like. Uh, pulling off the top of the tomb, right? And like him fall, yeah. like falling back and then trying to crush him with it is great. It's such good, like slapsticky, uh, like vampire gags. Like it was unexpectedly fun. I didn't expect things to be so light and playful. And that scene has this like elevated playfulness that like it reads like a cartoon or like a good comic. It's so, so fun. It's that also, scene. it's a good use of Slayer strength. Like the way they shoot it, you totally believe she has like the strength and the speed to like pull that tomb lid so fast he falls off. <laughs> oh, it's such a good gag. I love it. And then just Spike straight up painting his nails, which I haven't looked at his nails to see if he paints them frequently. I think it's pretty frequently, right? I think they're, they're, they're always pretty much painted. always black. Yeah, I think they're yeah. always black. painted. Yeah. Uh, in the act. Love it. So punk. Uh, so uh, speaking of alleys, Sunnydale Hospital is apparently adjacent to just a bunch of alleys because like when don follows the ambulance in she's just surrounded by dirty back alleys you know <laughs> uh, sunnydale's uh, got some weird geography it's always linked by alleys you know like you think like by sewer tunnels but you can just take an alley and go anywhere <laughs> <laughs> So the power to morph into people is really powerful and I'm confused about how it works in this episode. Um, and then I want to talk about teleportation also, but the morphing thing. So while uh, Dawn is talking to Ben, he like starts to, he figures out she's the key and then is like immediately taken over by glory. He's like, she's coming. And like his body transforms into hers. Right. Or however this I happens. I don't remember this. Yeah. Yes. What are you talking about? 
Oh, the U.S. doing the choke. Oh, this is a joke? Okay. <laughs> anyway, so when Don's body takes over Ben's body, right, and, like, she teleports into him, what's crazy about this is, like, she doesn't have any knowledge of what conversation just happened, but then what would trigger her to move into his body? Like, she would need some kind of triggering event unless Ben called to her somehow, but it's just, like, she's talking, he, Ben discovers she has the key, and as soon as he has that knowledge, she must have some knowledge or something like it's unclear how that relationship works where she's now in you know in the hospital but also doesn't know the information that would have totally called her to be there so it's like this is super odd and not well i mean it builds the tension in the next scene but i just assumed glory would immediately know that don was the key and instead it's an interrogation scene that plays out which is a look the actress plays glory is amazing i love her in everything here she's got a fun uh you know way of dealing with things that are is is really exciting but like it doesn't make any sense okay you guys are smiling it, it does it does not about. make any sense yeah it's it's a it's a mystery the way it's presented it does not make any sense right now but stay tuned okay so clearly ben and glory share some things like a brain or some parts or their family so they have the same knowledge who knows how their dimension works but like also, that clearly teleporting into a person is way safer than teleporting generally. Uh, and just as a note, because <laughs> like, she gets teleported again as a, like to get rid of her, you know, when Willow and Tara like uh, throw, you know, glitter on her. But like this, oh, man, that sequence really bothered me. I don't like the way that teleportation scene worked because it took the tension and then it took it away. I mean, it ended up heightening it, but like it just uh, very confusing. Obviously, it sounds like they're going to justify it and explain why that works because glory and Ben, I'm going to make a prediction about this, but, uh, it was, it was confusing and frustrating, uh, to take that tension away. But, uh, anyway, that's that scene and you guys are being quiet, which is great. (laughs) I remember Ben and I remember glory, but I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but I do like, uh, Willow's new teleportation power. It's crazy. (laughs) Very strong. Uh, John, uh, yeah. What's um, the frequency? So, uh, just a really uh, interesting, timely reference. Uh, one of the uh, old, one of the uh, crazy people in the uh, in the mental ward when Don goes to the mental ward uh, in the middle of all his babbling. One of the things he says is, "What's the frequency?" So this is a reference to uh, there's the REM song, "What's the frequency, Kenneth?" Which is itself a reference to this weird thing that happened to Dan Rather, where he was like walking into uh, work at uh, at NBC. And somebody came up behind him and beat him in the back of the head repeatedly and was like, Kenneth, what's the frequency? Kenneth, what's the frequency? What's the frequency, Kenneth? And was beating him in the back of the head. And uh, it turned out later that this was the same person. He actually murdered somebody because he was somebody who had a delusion that NBC was uh, beaming signals into his brain. And uh, he wanted to know what the frequency was so he could he could stop it, I guess. Um, But for a long time, I guess. for a long time, I guess uh, Dan Rather didn't know why someone had hit him in the back of the head and shouted, what's the frequency, Kenneth? Um, and there's an R.E.M. song about it. Yeah. So this is a reference to that whole weird <laughs> situation. It's also referenced in uh, the Dan Klaus graphic novel, uh, Like a Velvet Glove, Cast an Iron. It's like the intro to the weird, crazy, like, cult society thing. <laughs> so it's a, Yeah, I thought that was a good reference also. I'm glad you brought it up because I was going to. Yeah, I didn't uh, understand that. But uh, OK, so Giles. So chew on this. Giles says the teleportation spell that Willow and um, uh, not Anya, Willow and uh, Tara, Tara did was dangerous. But no comment on Xander attacking Glory with a crowbar and being <laughs> immediately smashed or Buffy being impaled uh, as well by that said. I think it was a, that said crowbar or whatever. And I just think Giles doesn't want Willow to become a powerful witch. I mean, there's no reason. I mean, Willow is the one who came off with the least wear and tear out of that whole altercation. Right. She had a bloody nose. I mean, Xander should have been killed. Like, let's be honest. Yeah. He's, he attacked a, a god or with a goddess. Crowbar. With and a crowbar. And a broken arm. Yeah. Yeah. He just had a broken arm by a troll like a couple weeks ago. And then Buffy like impaled. But it's like, oh, no, Willow, that was dangerous. <laughs> like, Willow didn't get hit by anyone. <laughs> and she from, saved from everyone. Like, um, and she continued, saved everyone. From, like, a continued storytelling point of view, 
Uh, Willow is getting too strong because when you can like just fucking teleport any villain, like that is a storytelling issue. Well, it wasn't very far away though, so she didn't teleport her to the Alps. Teleport wow. her into the ground. I mean, just get rid of them, Jesus, right? <laughs> I mean, I think if that was anyone else but a god being teleported, like you know, a thousand feet up would be like an ender. Yeah, that's a high level spell. That was great. Yeah. It's also funny, uh, Giles is like, that's an extraordinary dangerous spell for a, a wi- or for a witch of your level. But it's like, is he talking about that standard British level? <laughs> <laughs> Which we still don't know her level. Is it like one British witch level is like 2.2 American <laughs> levels? <laughs> they're, on the, they're on the metric witch levels over there. Yeah. Uh, well, we follow the Salem witch scale, right? And they've got like, some like Notting- Nottinghamshire witch scale. And it's like a long time ago, those witch scales were equivalent. But over time, they've div- diverged. Yeah, everything's changed since we've gone off the drowning uh, schedule. Yeah. So we've gone off the gold standard since we've gone off the drowning standard. There you go. There we go. I'm just saying Willow wasn't the one that did the most dangerous thing during that fight scene. That's, uh, a, that's a good point. That's, yeah. What I'm saying. Also, was, Xander, Xander defies death so frequently, it's almost unbelievable. Also, like, since Spike is a vampire, like, you can just do any amount yeah. of damage you want to him. He's like, <laughs> just like, oh, he's going to brag about her not being so tough and then beat, beat unconscious. But it's okay. He's a vampire. Yeah, yeah rag, ragdoll him around. Yeah. yeah. Xander does have Bilbo Baggins level luck, really. It's <laughs> oh, crazy. <laughs> For now. Uh, oh yes, and then I said, Oh, Buffy needs some consent before that summer's blood oath, <laughs> which is like definitely not as kosher as you think it would be. Like I was trying to think of like, what if Buffy had some communicable demon disease from her time spent in like that hell dimension, right? I mean, there's like a million reasons why you don't, you know. I, what if there's like some demon hepatitis C that Buffy has? <laughs> You know, I'm just, I'm just saying. Yeah, when like, was the last time she got a full blood work? Yeah. <laughs> As a doctor, you're saying mingling your blood with with a friend is is generally frowned upon. This is yes. your medical opinion. Gen- yes, g- especially if that <laughs> if, if that friend had spent any time in a demon or hell dimension, <laughs> or banging or, monsters, or or had had <laughs> paranormal encounters. I was trying to think if Buffy's been bitten by anything either. I was like, what? Yeah, she's been bitten by Dracula and yep. Angel. Yeah, uh, Dracula and Angel. Was she, has she been bitten by any just regular things? <laughs> I guess not. Yeah. Any regular I mean, monsters? Yeah. When she's fighting in alleys, does she ever get bit by a rat? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> I mean, it was like emotionally great, but I'm just like... <laughs> <laughs> Your doctor. I was mind. like, no, we have not yeah. seen a... Yeah. I'm These like, poor it, Summers girls with their like giant opening open yeah. wounds, you know? <laughs> And of course, Dawn, like she's only six months old or a million years old, but she didn't. She doesn't really quite understand how things work. It's like she she would, didn't have really informed consent when she's like, "Yeah, let's do this." <laughs> it was more like, "I'm doing this, and you're my shocked younger sister." Oh, this is sweet. I, don't well, know. I, I love the scene. It's with a great Buffy scene. And Dawn. In some ways. It was such an emotionally good yes. scene. It felt really needed. And yeah. thanked, it helped really resolve resolved all the insanity I was feeling um, since the first episode in this season when Don appeared. And now it's resolved and it felt really good. And it gave me some feels for that resolution. Um, also, it ties into the episode name and an overall theme, a recurring theme this episode of Blood Ties. Yeah. So. But also, it's like... It's, you know, it's like the summer's blood. It's like it, if they weren't sisters, it's not like like Dawn would burst into flames. I mean, there's like a little bit of like thinking that doesn't quite work out. Like her justification is we're summer's blood. We share the same blood, right? And then they, they touch bloody hands. But it's like she wouldn't have like exploded if she wasn't her sister. But so the logic is a little bit strange. Like, you know, she was she's trying to use some crazy logic, some crazy slayer logic, I guess. Whoa, what if maybe maybe a Slayer blood and like non-Slayer blood, maybe that does cause like a thermogenic reaction or something. But but Buffy wouldn't know that. Anyways, I'm I'm nitpicking like that. I, I don't think there's going to be ed- any reaction to the blood and blood being commingled, but maybe I'm being foolish. I mean, if this was <sighs> Spider-Man, there's a potential of like 
like whoever he did that with gaining some like temporary spider powers, right? But temporary. Really, it's only temporary. I don't know. I mean, well, no, a blood transfusion is how She Hulk became She Hulk. She got a blood transfusion from her cousin Bruce Banner, and that's permanent. So you think <laughs> Dawn is going to get a little power from this? Is that what you're trying to? Fake no, me out just, about? no, no, no. I mean, just, that, she uh, should. In theory, she should. In I'm not saying book, it's happening. In comic book blood transfer is what yeah. happens. That's what magicalness does. To, you know, does have an effect. Well, that, that feels like barely enough blood to me. That's that's not enough for like. It's not a full transfusion. Sure. For Dawn to get Slayer powers, I'm going to say no on that. Thank you guys. That was a nice try. I'm not. <laughs> <a prediction. laughs> oh, I'm, we're not saying that. I'm just. <laughs> oh, I, I know you're exploring uh, what a blood transfusion could do. Magically. This sounds like it's questions for the group. Let's do questions for the group. How many pints of blood must be transfused <laughs> from a slayer to a non-slayer to grant magical powers? It's disgusting that me not being a doctor, when I hear pints of blood, I picture like a Ben and Jerry's ice cream pint <laughs> just filled with Buffy's blood. <laughs> All right. Oh, questions for worst the group. mix in ever. <laughs> <laughs> it has some dumb pun like summer's breeze but like. <laughs> this is at butcher and jerry's which is a completely different <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah dub blood and jerry's anyway there it is uh okay so here's the question for the group questions for the group You find out that six months ago you were born and all your memories are fake. What do you do? That's a good question. By um, the way, you're your age now, whatever your age is now, uh, like in the way that you look and uh, the way you have the, the family that you had now, all those things, uh, you, all those memories are fake. I think I would, my, the, my first like trying to figure it out reaction would be to like look at physical objects I own that are more than six months old. You know, because I think that is interesting to me of like, not only was I created, but everything around me is was also physically manifested. Right. Uh, the existential crisis stuff will probably be entering into my head. Sure. But the mechanics it is, of it. it is more about the existential crisis than the physical stuff, for sure. I mean, the physical stuff is there, right? Because that's how powerful this magic is. So it's it's like you've been living that whole time, but you've discovered that you've only you're only six months old. Do you like start like, cause we're older. So there's like a lot of like people from our past who we don't have like constant contact with. So do you start contacting them to be like, do you, do remember, you remember me? me? Yeah. Do I exist to you? <laughs> yeah. Like how far back does this spell work? Everybody knows that you are a manifestation except you. Ugh. Ugh, wait, wait, everyone knows you're not real or everyone has memories of you everybody that's close to you everyone that's in your family your family knows that you're a manifestation oh so if i call like an ex who i haven't seen in like five years would they be like my ghost boyfriend who i imagined or would they be <laughs> like <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a good question i mean uh, i'm I just, just imagining gone. a hilarious like conversation where somebody's like uh that's nothing I dated somebody who's only manifested recently in my memory. <laughs> <laughs> well, what does Don's Spanish class feel about that? I mean, they've all had their memories messed with, right? So they got to assume that she's been there the whole time. So I assume that only your family knows that you're not real. Everyone else has just accepted the blanket reality, whatever, that you've always yeah. been there. Or like, how do you react if you find out that somebody you know wasn't real? Like. Um you know, somebody who had like a really powerful impact on you, but they, they turned out that 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 wasn't that never really happened. Or somebody who had a very minor impact on you is like, oh, that person who was a regular when I worked at Subway, that person's yeah. not real. <laughs> Great. So it sounds like everyone wants I would, more detail. Yeah, <laughs> I would also question. be extra like, like I, you, there's I, such I, an I, opportunity to be extraordinarily mean to that person and be like. So somebody, people with God level powers created you and they created you <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, yeah. Or about yourself. Yeah. Somebody with God level powers created somebody and they came up with this. 
But this, this Mike, is like, Mike, I'll answer your question. I would go on a road trip. I would probably sell everything I had or burned everything I had to see what like I actually enjoyed. Right. Because if you destroy something, then you're like, oh, I'm going to miss that. And then like, I think you have to challenge every single part of your relationship with everything to see what's like what you actually like. Because if it was all implanted, you may not actually like it. But if you destroy it and then you miss it, then you're like, OK, that, that's kind of what I'm into. Ooh. So burn my house down, destroy everything I own, go on a road trip. Step one. I mean, why yeah, not I do that anyway? Right, because it is like act one of the hero's journey to discover that life <laughs> that you needed to find new meaning for life. So this is a good, good. That's a make that makes sense. The road trip makes sense, but obviously, like, do you take anyone with you? No, this is like a solo journey. It has to be of self discovery. Unless you meet a British guy with platinum blonde hair. I suppose it's it's uh, it's <laughs> Pinocchio, right? That's more or less the story we're talking about, right? Does Pinocchio believe he had a life before? I mean, does no, he but he like the, just the question of like your own, what's your own authenticity? What are you like? What's real about oh, you? Sure. And then like, like you said, going on a journey to try to discover that. Yeah, Is so that why Pinocchio killed Geppetto? I, I mean, I haven't read that book in a very, very long time. I, I think Geppetto died of cancer. I'll look that up. <laughs> this never came up in the Disney movie. I mean, yeah, you find the person that, you know, made you and then you unmake them. Duh. There is something about uh, attacking Geppetto or killing him in that. I know he kills the, the cricket in the book. Yeah. What about Lore? I thought Lore killed Geppetto. <laughs> I'm looking it up right now. This stunning okay, radio. so obviously this is such a disturbing <laughs> question that no one can answer it because they just want to answer Travis had a good answer, but otherwise it's like, I need more details because it's too terrifying. Well, I mean, I think, I think, I think think that the, the, of course it's always true of all of us, right? Because all memories are, are inaccurate or are stories that have been told and retold. So like, I mean, I'm sorry, I know that's kind of like a sideways answer, but like, uh, I think we're moving on to themes and deep stuff. So let's do that. Deep stuff. You know, I do really relate to, to, to Don in these moments where of like, uh, sort of like existential terror of like, Oh, what's real about me? Cause you know, memories are as mediated as anything. They're as, uh, malleable as anything. And when you mem- remember something, uh, the second time you're not necessarily remembering it, you're remembering, remembering it. And, uh, so I think there's a lot of ways in which what Don's experiencing is just sort of the human condition, right? Like we're all just sort of. So it's also a question of, uh, like continuity of self, right? right? Um, which is something I irritate with my friends with, cause they'll be like, you know, would you go on a transporter? Because that's basically killing you and restarting you as a different person. And I'm like, I don't care. Like, (laughs) I'll be a different, as long as I'm a different person who thinks I'm the same person, I don't see the difference. It's fine to me. Uh, So I guess that's an argument where, like, that's where I come down on, like, I guess I don't believe in the continuity of self. Right. Do you, wait, so you're cool with, like, uh, scanning your brain into a hard drive? You're done with that? You're going to be lined up for that one? Uh, I mean, I'm definitely going to wait. For like three or four generations, I'm not going to like be trial yeah. one on yeah, that. Yeah, don't buy into the beta version of that technology. <laughs> Imagine how loud that hard drive would be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's, I mean, to me, it's similar to like, um, like an anesthetic is like your body still is experiencing that. That pain still exists. It just doesn't reach your brain, right? Like as long as like shit is real or not real, but as long as like it doesn't affect, as long as. You think it's okay? It's okay. Yeah. I don't know. So your your perspective is everything, really. Yeah, which is cool. So I, I guess I'm saying I don't think I'd be freaked out by finding out I wasn't real because I'm like ah, I'm real now. Well, I, I I'm already not real. <laughs> I'm as real as ever. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's one thing to be told like you're not real, but you're something else. But what, I mean, the scariest thing would be like Don's not real, and you're actually nothing. Or you're like the scrap, the scraps of a of somebody's nightmare. That would be messed up, no. right? 
I, like you're I'm like a, you're like a balloon, Don. You're like a balloon. You're just full of some air, and then when you know that, that's worse than being told you're like this immortal key. I mean, that's kind of cool. That's like in in today's world, being unique trumps everything else. <laughs> I feel like there's so much inertia. I feel like I'm with Dennis. I'm like, oh, I'm all, I was already here, I guess. You know, just like kind of play with it. Like whatever. I, I would be hard to stop that reality from feeling real because it had been my reality. I just learned that new detail. I yeah. I would just continue that course. <laughs> uh, do we have more to say about Don's existential crisis? I mean, I guess they don't. They haven't, and this is like the first episode, but they don't do like a good job. You know, you think a show that like focused on humans and demons and vampires and hell dimensions would like be a little more reassuring that like, Don, you're the key. I mean, you're my sister. Oh God, I don't want to get into that. But it's like, (laughs) they should like reassure that she's something or someone. Like Mm -hmm. just because you're not maybe a human doesn't mean you're not nothing. Um, Like they should, they should have had some positive reinforcement. Instead, they're just kind of like, yeah, you're the key. I don't know. You'd think like there'd be some positive reinforcement that you were still, she was still something, you know, worthwhile or exciting or you, you know, something like that. Oh, I think that's exactly what makes it interesting is that uh, the idea of uh, a key is, is, is ambiguous except in, a, in as much as it's an object, right? So like we don't know, yeah, what we don't yet know what she's a key to, what it means to be a key. We know it's sort of vaguely energy that we, what we know about the key is almost nothing except that it seems to be an object, except that it became Dawn, right? And so I think what's interesting about that is that um, it allows you to kind of, like you're saying, like project onto it whatever positives or negatives that you want. So uh, so we don't know what Dawn is, we just know what she isn't, which is a normal person. And uh, everything else we have is is only these false memories and suppositions. And so everybody kind of like all the characters, and you can see Buffy enjoys doing this, like, they have a choice of meaning. They can to decide for themselves what Dawn is and what Dawn means to them. And you can see them actively making the choice that um, if it looks like a sister or a daughter and it smells like a sister or a daughter, then God damn it, that's going to be my sister or daughter. Uh, it's chock full of blood. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I think yeah, that's I think- what's really interesting about it. And, and Dawn's doing that herself, right? She's trying to decide, is her own self anything? And yeah, obviously that's oh, yeah. Thing, no, I agree. Like Trav just brought up that I want to bring up again is that this show is full of hell dimensions or demon dimensions. And like, it's full of like things that seem like they are like very solidly defining, like the existence of a soul and God and stuff. And yet the show is still very agnostic. Right. Uh, which I think is really interesting to like be directly like confronted with like, existence in this very like non-theoretical way and still be like eh, soul no soul i don't know like like we know this is a show that acknowledges souls exists right uh it's major plot points and it's still like doesn't take a like this was gonna move into my other themes and deep stuff but it like they use the term in this episode demon dimensions instead of hell because like it's like all uh agnostic right it's less theologically loaded to say demon dimension than to say hell yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, just, I I feel like it's a really bold move for a show that like is using all of the trappings of religion, but to like not step like cross his work. But like, yeah, we don't really God know why, or, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. And yeah, like if you create that's a, super interesting, Jess, you know? that's really nice. That's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like interesting. Yeah. it's it's a it's a strategic ambiguity, right? It's sort of like we're going to you know borrow some of the power of the iconography of of religion, but we're not going to get too specific about it because that would trouble yeah the agnostic world we want the story to, to exist in. And like like I mean with the thing of like Don of like a human being was created, but does this human be like does this human being have a soul? Is the key a soul? Like. But the soul question doesn't even come up this episode. Like, that is right. not a thing she's struggling with, right? It's, yeah. Heavy theoretics, man. Yeah, there is a lot they could do with that. I mean, I guess that's why the emotional resonance of the last scene where, you know, Buffy kind of embraces Donna as her sister is so powerful because it's like the, like a lifeline in like a, a place where they could go a ton of different directions, right? They could talk about a soul. As some kind of value. There's like a lot of 
strings that are not picked up. A lot of directions you could go. But that's that's what this show's about. It's like throwing out all these ideas and it doesn't necessarily, you know, I mean the dimension thing, that's crazy to do. You're right, because then it you're totally skipping the the religious the theological aspects of it. I was so disappointed that Ani didn't talk about the dimension without shrimp. I know. <laughs> I was like so ready to be triggered. Potential I was like, for shrimp dimension. I was like, prime, 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 prime. <laughs> She's going to mention this dimension without shrimp. Like, it would have been so easy. She could have been like, Giles didn't even know about the dimension that didn't have any shrimp. Oh, we didn't even talk about how like Giles is hurt by Anya being like, I know more about demon dimensions than, than Giles. Like, fucking accept that you're not the expert in everything, Giles. Tony is a thousand and has been a demon. <laughs> and has been actually a demon. You have not been that. Well, you've summoned demons. You have not been a demon. Yeah. I loved that. That was great. All right, dudes. Uh, let's move on to recommendations. Recommendations. I am picking movies that deal with either false memories or people finding out that they are not who they think they are. So I'll start with the uh, Sam Rockwell movie Moon, um, directed by David Bowie's son. Uh, Sam, if you haven't seen it, some spoilers. The Sam Rockwell character we're, finding, if we're following for most of the movie finds out he's a clone. Uh, so, and deals with the... <laughs> yeah, I spoiled it. I still hadn't seen that, but now it's ruined, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's still a good movie, and it is. Sad. It's the clone movie. I guess it, it. is sad. And movies. also, and al- sorry. Also, that that's like not a like third act revelation. That's yeah. like something you figure you that finds. out pretty early on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that movie bummed me out, though, man. <laughs> well, if you want a a much more fun movie about uh, b- not being sure who you are, watch the Schwarzenegger Total Recall. Because that movie is awesome and fun. <laughs> it deals with an existential <laughs> crisis in the dumbest way possible. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> yeah, but uh, that's when you find out you're a secret agent or whatever. That's way cooler than just like, like, yeah, like the, the it's not quite an existential crisis in the Dawn way. But yeah, totally. Yeah. It's but it's like, way. you know, it's like it's it, it's based on like a Philip K. Dick novel, right? Yes. Yeah. We'll remember it for you wholesale is the, is the book. Yeah, and like Philip K. Dick was like a deep dude and he was like really getting into like, I haven't read the book, but I assume he's like really getting into the the notion of like, you are not who you remember you are and all that stuff. And then like Paul Verhoeven and Schwarzenegger make this movie and they just use it as like the dumbest plot point to like, like fuck Martians, you know, like (laughs) it's awesome. I'm sure I've recommended it before, but it's a really fun movie. Uh, I'm also going to recommend the movie Dark City. Um, I don't know. Does somebody else want to talk about Dark City? It's been a, a minute since I've seen it. I'm throwing that at somebody else. Uh, it's do. a good movie with uh, false memories, a lot of like you know, sort of dark noir kind of cinematography. It was one of uh, Roger Ebert's favorite films. Uh, didn't he? Didn't he do the commentary? Isn't there like a? If yes. you buy the DVD, there's like a special Ebert commentary. I believe that's right. Awesome. I just I remember that movie being confusing in theaters. Yeah. And uh, have, having good cinematography, though, but also like being being confused and surprised that it was taking place on another dimension, like hurling through space or whatever, because <laughs> you think it's going to be like some cool noir city. And then uh, it's a weird dimension. Like, yeah, I, th- I could be mistaken because I think that the 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 science fiction aspect of the film is not they don't let that out in the trailer. Oh, that wait, right? sorry. That's probably a spoiler. It's that. okay. I, it's I mean, fine. I spoiled, I spoiled Moon. It's yeah, whatever. Dark City's been out for, what, dude, 25 years? Uh, yeah. yeah probably Three days <laughs> the Matrix. <laughs> I've never yeah. seen Dark City. It's good. It's, re- worth, it's definitely worth a watch. Definitely worth Is watch. it worth rewatching? Because I remember it being a weird mess. Uh, I, I think I, it's, I, yeah. It might, um, arguably, it's slow. I think it is kind of slow, but I, 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 I really like it. It's also one of those weird miscast, like, it's good casting, but... Keith Sutherland plays like the super nerd in it. And like, that's just not like anything he's been since then. That sounds more, that sounds almost as bad is when, um, oh my God. Jennifer yeah. Connelly's in that movie. Yeah. No, no, no. Someone was cast as a nuclear physicist called Christmas Jones in a James Bond movie. And it was, uh, Denise Richards, Denise Richards. That's probably the most insane <laughs> casting ever. Ooh. Uh, I thought Christmas uh, only came once a year. 
Boo. <laughs> boo, James Bond. Boo. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Uh, I'm also going to recommend the book Secret Diaries of Laura Palmer, uh, just because this is a diary episode and that uh, for people who no, we, I recommend Twin Peaks a lot on this show. Uh, so it's a supplemental. In the in the show Twin Peaks, Laura Palmer has a secret diary that goes missing and is found, and then they publish the books. And it was uh, the journal entries. I think were written by um, Jennifer Lynch, uh, who did Hiss, which I recommended a, a few weeks ago. Um, and it's interesting, and fills in some of the mysteries, and also deepens the mysteries because it's Twin Peaks. Uh, all right, let's move on to predictions. Virgin predictions. Here's where we stand at the moment. Michael, uh, you have a 63.86% accuracy overall. Uh, and for this season, you are currently at a 693 we do not have a lot to address from this episode, but a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, I don't think we're going to settle this, but uh, at the beginning of this season, Michael, you predicted that Buffy doesn't have a sister. Uh, I think we're going to, we decided that we're just going to table this discussion until the end of season five, but that was clearly touched on in this episode. So I wanted to remind mm -hmm. everybody that that's an open prediction. Uh, and then the other one I want to talk about is uh, in episode nine of this season, Michael, you predicted that Ben has more cleaning up to do. And I believe, you know, Ben's cleaning up is taking care of all the uh, crazies left in the wake of uh, Glory's brain sucking. So um, there was an extra brain suck this episode. So I think we can go ahead and confirm that, that there is at least one more, uh, one, one more crazy person for, for Ben to clean up. Is everybody okay with me confirming that? Sure. Okay. Fantastic. After that one confirmation, your overall accuracy has gone from a 63.86 to a 64 even. And your accuracy for this season has gone from a 69.23 to a 70.37 even, thus taking you from a D to a C. Congrats, dude. It's your first time in the Cs for a while. New predictions, okay. Michael? Uh, of course I have new predictions. Uh, I'm going to start with, the, with that one that now appears obvious that Ben and Gloria are the same person. Is that allowed as a prediction? Of course it is. I was initially thinking that was teleportation <laughs> that was taking place, but after uh, the psychedelic response uh, being <laughs> gaslit somewhat, I would so say... So you suspect there's some connection between the two? Yeah, I mean, they're brother-sister, but not really, because they're the same person. Weird. Okay. It's an interesting reaction. But Ben and Gloria are the same person, so that's one. Two, Glory can use Dawn as a key without killing Dawn. Dawn's, of course, terrified of being killed. Uh, Glory cannot go much longer without figuring out Dawn is the key. This is now, we're in uh, season five, episode 13. Uh, come on. Can we do this for another 13 episodes or whatever it is? Come on. No way. Let's get this over with. Uh, I believe Glory's dimension is Arthurian. Can you be more specific? What does that mean, Arthurian? I think I've tried to hint at, or maybe we talked a little bit, or I just thought it out in my, to myself and haven't said it out loud. But Glory uh, has like kind of a Morgana Le Fay, you know, she has kind of a Arthurian vibe to her. There's knights, her minions. You did are call her of, a dragon, yeah. Yeah, I will. Remember that. Yeah. Uh, I think there's there's some Arthurian themes that need to play out. Um, you know, these knights are kind of underpowered to take her on. Maybe the Knights of the Round Table or some similar knights need to be summoned to take care of her. We just need some tougher knights, guys. Big time. Yeah, I also, I, I was going to bring up this episode that the Knights of Byzantium or whatever, they keep talking about their legions, but we've never seen more than four. <laughs> <laughs> also, like, yeah, they're, they're this, like... They're, they're, they're this sect that this is, this is what they do, is this, right? They don't do anything else. So what are they waiting for? What are they holding back their legions for? What's the, uh, like, when does it get more real than this? Well, they need a leader, you know, they need a Buffy, the Buffy Summers to lead them on to battle. Yes. Yeah, so that is a prediction you made, uh, I believe last episode. Right. So I'm not going to make that prediction again. Um, 
I believe Dawn is going to gain memories of her ancient self somehow. You know, she's been around forever. She's going to gain some of those memories and become, I mean, I'll just say that. I don't need to say more beyond that. She's going to gain memories of her ancient self and she's going to, Dawn is going to cast a super powerful spell. We haven't seen Dawn cast magic. She's very interested in magic. Well, when she gets those ancient memories, but I'm not connecting that prediction to this one. I'm just saying, I believe it will happen afterwards, but that's not a prediction that Dawn, when she gets a hold of these ancient memories, is going to learn to have some magic as a part of that and is going to cast the magic that will... I want to make another prediction, but we've already made five, but uh, I believe that Dawn is going to stop Glory. We're not predicting Dawn will stop Glory, or we are. I mean, I'd like to, but I've made five, but I'm going to make another. So my okay. super prediction, Dawn will stop Glory. Okay, and as a super prediction, this one will count for five times the normal amount. Travis has his eyes closed. Uh-oh. What does that mean? He's sleepy. No, he's trying not to. He's like, ugh, a oh, poly big mistake. <laughs> I didn't say anything. He could be closing his eyes because it, you're just too you're too re- accurate. It's too real. It's like it's either no. ultra accurate or way off base. Great. Or a mix of both. Sometimes your sometimes your predictions are just a headache. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. Sometimes it's just like it's ambiguous enough that he knows we're gonna have an argument about it and he doesn't want to be around <laughs> he's just, for that. Yeah. He's just having <laughs> okay. a headache for the argument. I'm already <laughs> predicting a good argument about uh, one of these. Is it Don will stop glory or Ben and Glory are the same person? Those no, like it's arguments. uh I think multiples. Mo- these are multiple arguments about multiple things you just predicted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, define stop. Okay, like that, like yeah. that level. Do we need to redefine any of these? Oh God! What does it mean to be the same person? Like schizophrenia? Like is it schizophrenia? No, no. It's, it's not what schizophrenia is. <laughs> multiple personality disorder. Cool. That's it. Thank you, John. All right. I really appreciate your work on this <laughs> project. Lies. <laughs> John, are you officially a project manager for Buffy Predictions? <laughs> I mean, I've got a spreadsheet which I use to tell people how their uh, how their performance <laughs> is doing. So yes, I think I am the project manager. <laughs> I, uh, I, I like right. to think of this uh, as the uh, Virgin <laughs> Performance Review. Oof. But it's fucking weekly. <laughs> uh, I've been your host, uh, Dennis St. John. I'm at Dennis Comics. That's D-E-N-I-S-C-O-M-I-X on Twitter and Instagram. And that is my dot com. Uh, you can buy my book, Land of Many Monsters and Many More Monster Tales. And uh, my other one, Amelia Monster and Girls book uh, on Amazon. Uh, and I'm working on some new creature comic creations. Uh, that you can find on my Patreon. And um, yeah, that's what I'm doing. Uh, Mike, are you uh, doing anything? I hear some rumblings. Uh, yeah, I'm working on YouTube content, but I'm trying to uh, post as a series on Dungeons and Dragons related dungeon prep. Uh, hopefully a six episode series that will Whoa. come out when I'm ready. Um, I want it to look nice. So working on that. Looking forward to that. <laughs> if you want to do D&D, yeah, totally. <laughs> Uh, I think there's probably a crossover audience between D&D and this. Um, I want to thank you all for listening and talking to us at Buffy Virgin. Uh, you can visit our website, BuffyVirgin.com, for links to our blog, our YouTube, our Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, reach out. We love to hear from you. And don't forget to rate and review us on the podcast listener of your choice. And we'll see you in hell. <laughs>